that would be fun to wear while I preach, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you know, one thing I haven't said today yet is good morning. Good morning. How, how are you guys doing? Great. Doing good? Great. I didn't hear anybody say anything that they're not doing well. So that's, that's good. This morning, as we, as we uh, dive in today, I want you to think about this whole last month and what it's been about. I want you to think about what we've been studying because for the last month, uh, we have been looking through God's Word as a church with a specific focus on missions. Uh, as we've been going through this, uh, God has actually been challenging my own heart and, and He's called me to change my thinking. You know, a lot of times I, like, I, I want to get up here and I want to, I want to point it at people and say, it's you, I want you to do this, and I want you to, you know, I, I, it'd be more fun to do that. But through this month, I've really found myself challenged and, and, and the way that I, uh, I, I thought that I was. I always felt like I've had this very strong urge towards missions. I always felt like I had a very, uh, a very uh, focused um, drive to the gospel being kind of centrally located in, in, my, in my ministry and in my life. Uh, but this month, I've had to realize a few things about my own heart towards missions. Uh, how many of you know what the word introspection means? Introspection. There's a few of you. <laughs> introspection is, is when I, I actually look inside. Just to make it simple. is I look in and I see where I'm at. I look in and I see what, what's going on in my own heart. I've heard the words of God. I've been reflecting on the words of God. I've been reading and studying and spending time with God. But what is it doing? What am I doing? How am I responding? Where is that within me? And, and introspection is one of my least favorite things. Uh, because each time I slow down enough to, to look within, I find that I, I've been running kind of like a madman in the wrong direction or with the wrong motives. Uh, and as we've turned our scope onto missions here, I once again found myself misled by my flesh into a very dangerous mentality towards missions. As I realized this, I began to think about our church and, and through watching, through listening, uh, and through just experiencing it, uh, I've, I've found that we as a church kind of tend to lean towards the same very dangerous form of thinking. We have fallen into kind of a worldly idea of missions, and we've put aside the true mission that we're called to in this. Maybe you've been feeling as though you're doing, uh, you're doing really well in, in your attitude and involvement in missions, and I'm not here to, uh, to judge in, in each and every one. I'm not going to sit up here and say, you, this is what you've done. That's, I don't want, we don't have time for that, and I don't, I'm not going to do it. Um, some of you do so much better at this than I do. Some of you have a heart that is so, so driven in missions that I, I look and I'm always encouraged hearing what you're doing, seeing what you're doing. I, I absolutely love it, but even for those of you who feel that you're doing really well in this, I'd ask you and, and actually challenge you today to listen to what God's Word is calling us to, to listen to what we see in His Word, just to make sure. Do a little introspection today as we study. It, it take some time to look and say, okay, I feel like I've been doing well in my involvement in this, but am I aligning with what God's Word says? Am I doing what He has called me to, or am I doing what I feel like I should do? In my mission's focus, my personal one, I have found three major places where I've erred. Those three areas are prayer, sharing, and caring. In, and we're, we're going to start with prayer. And if you have your Bible with you, open up to the book of Colossians, chapter 4. We're going to look at, starting in verse 2. Colossians 4, and we're going to look at 2 through 4 here. It says, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. The very first word that we see in, in verse 2 uh, is where most of us have already fallen short. The word is devote. I want you to think about what devotion means. 
We think, you know, in, in, in kind of the Christian world, we think devotions, we think of our daily time with God, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, devotion, what the actual word definition is. Does it mean an occasional thing? Uh, does it mean a kind of a half-hearted thing? Does it mean a, a scattered, careless, or general thing? It, I, if you're still having trouble deciding on a good definition of devotion, I want you to picture this with me. This will really help you. A husband looks at his wife and he says to her, I am devoted to you. I don't want you to think of what the husband means. I want you to think of what the wife thinks he means. I want you to think about what she hears when she hears the word devotion, devoted. Because husbands, we, we have to admit, sometimes we like to use words like devoted because it's a good word, right? It's, it's a nice word. It sounds good. It, it fits, you know. But do we mean it the same way that our wives hear it, do you think? Mark Wood's admitting no. No, it's just how it is. Okay, we've got one. No. <laughs> but I, I think about this, and I think about those words, and I actually sat down with Janae, and I asked her. I said, okay, if I were to look at you and say, I'm devoted to you, what would that mean? And she actually, I did a pretty good job, but she had actually, um, not to toot my own horn here, but she she listed off some things that I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I already put that. But then later she texted me some more. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like, okay, okay, I, I get it, you know. And it, it was just one of those things that you're like, wow, you've really been thinking about this. It's, I appreciate it. But when, when a husband says to his wife, I'm devoted to you, she, she isn't picturing a future of half-hearted, occasional, careless life together. It's not what she's picturing. She's picturing a constant, growing, thriving, faithful, wholehearted life. So when this verse starts off with a call for us to devote ourselves to prayer, I want you to realize that Paul is talking about a consistent, faithful, thriving, growing, wholehearted drive to pray. He's not asking for half-hearted. He's not asking for what we would normally use devoted in. He's asking for something real. The other day I was driving and I did one of those things that I, I often find myself doing where I suddenly just share something that I feel is deeply profound that's been sitting on my mind for a little bit. And, and I, I normally am met with a very confused huh from Janae when I share these things because a lot of times it does not uh, make sense. And out of nowhere, we're kind of having a conversation. We're driving around the little, uh, we call it our driveway, but it's, it's the little road around the football field by our house. And, and as we were going around that, out of nowhere, I just kind of blurted out, overchurched and underprayed. And Janae looked at me in a way that seemed to say, if, if blurting that out made sense to you, then you probably shouldn't be driving. <laughs> but she understood what I meant, but, but as I tell the youth, I like to speak a lot before I think because I want to be just as surprised as what comes out of my mouth as they are. But with this, I had realized something in my own heart and it just kind of came out of my mouth. <laughs> I myself am overchurched and underprayed. I spend hours a week at youth group, discipleship class, worship team practice, Sunday school, board and pastoral meetings, connecting with the teens at the schools, college group, and, and just the regular church service. Hours a week. But even if I put all of my times in prayer together, on an average week, on a good average week, I may get an hour of prayer in, in a week. And I, I want you to realize something about this. You may be looking at me going, oh, that's bad. I want you to hear this because I, I want you to not be thinking just about my failings in this. Um, that's okay if you need to. You can think about mine. But the average Christian spends a minute a day in prayer. That's the average that means you have some that, yes, we have some that spend two, three hours or two, three days maybe in prayer. But you also have some that don't pray for two, three years. But I want you to realize the average is a minute. One minute a day. For pastors, the average is five minutes a day. That's the average. Husbands, I, I'm going to challenge you again. I'm going to give you something to think about. I want you, I'm, I'm going to challenge you with this. This week, take one day and give your wife one to five minutes of communication and see how your relationship goes for that day. I'm really, I don't want you to actually do that. But I want you to think about what that would look like. I want you to think about what that would do in that relationship just for that day. To only give one to five minutes of communication. We talk with our youth at Discipleship Group. We, we a couple weeks ago, actually got together and took the whole night, the whole hour, just to, just to pray. 
We didn't have a script. We didn't have a, a, a plan of here, pray through this, pray through that. I gave them some ideas of things, but we, we sat down, we prayed for an hour. And most of us at the end of the hour went, whoa, an hour's done. That was, it, it came so fast, like it was, it was just done. But I can tell you for almost every single one in that room, that was the first time ever that they had sat down and prayed for an hour straight. It's the first time ever that they had slowed down enough to do that. And it was kind of a cool thing to watch um, anywhere from, from seventh graders up to seniors in high school praying. And they were moving all around the building at different points just because sometimes they're like, you know what, I've, I've sat up here for so long I can't even think of anything else to pray for. And, and sometimes I think that that's the point that we need to get to, though, is, is we, we need to get to a point of being still before God. We need to get to a point that we pray so much that is, it's not this thing that we, we all noticed when we were talking right afterwards that the moment we started to pray, it was almost like everything was just this bombardment of stuff that I needed to get before God. And, and what I came to an understanding of in that time was the reason why my mind did that was because I don't pray enough. When I do come before God, I have this huge list of requests that I've not brought to him. And so I feel like it's this scattered, crazy mess that I'm trying to share before God. That I'm trying to bring before God all at once and pile it on. And after about 30 minutes of doing that, I got to a point where I went, okay, it's all out. Now what? I spent about 30 minutes in just silent introspection, just being still and, and realizing who God is. Remembering what what he has done for me, what he calls me to, and listening as he challenged my heart in these things. And it was just his incredible time of, of stopping and doing that. But how in the world can we expect to grow closer in a relationship with God by only giving him one to five minutes a day in prayer, in communication, in talking with him? I think that that's something we need to, we need to wake up and realize. We, we can't just uh, expect to to grow closer to him, grow in an understanding of him without ever being with him, without ever communicating with him. I'm not talking about a time of, of sitting down with my Bible and my coffee. I'm really talking about a time of sitting down with just him. It's not that his word is bad in any way, no. But I think that there's a reason why his word calls us to prayer so often. In Scripture, Jesus is mentioned that 45 times, it's 45 times that it's mentioned that he went away to pray. If it was mentioned 45 times, how many more times do you think he actually did? I want you to think about that. Jesus, who we look and say, well, he, he's God, went and talked to the Father over and over. One time he went and prayed on a hillside for an entire night spent the whole night praying and the next day he was choosing the 12 disciples that would become the apostles. And I believe he was going before God and, and took all night to, to get to a place of, of going, this is God's answer. This is who he wants. This is the Father's will. And it's not that Jesus was not aligned with God and, and would know these things that God could just speak to him, but I love the fact of his devotion and dedication as an example to us and the fact that he said, even though God can, the Father speaks right to me, even though I'm in constant accord and conversation with him, I still go before him. He spent an entire night doing this. And I love that. I think it's such a beautiful picture of what our, our lives with God need to be looking more like. The over-church side of us causes us to make impulse decisions about what we should do based upon kind of popular trends or maybe the attitude in the church. Uh, we even are driven more by our worry of what other Christians might think of us uh, more than we're worried about what God has planned for us in a lot of things. How many of you have ever made a decision in, in what you'd be involved in or not involved in without praying but thinking about what somebody else in the church would think about you if you didn't sign up? I want you to realize that. How many of you guys, before you signed up for, for any of the things in the, in the sign-up sheets back there, how many of you, before we voted on our bylaws, have taken time to sit and pray about it? And, and I'm not going to tell you that I did any better with those things. But I think it's something we need to realize. We're making big decisions and we're not going to God. 
We're choosing based upon um, the influence of things around us and rather than the direction of the one who, who we should be trusting in these things. We need to fight this attitude. We need to change this. Paul goes on in, in verses 3 and 4 to ask for prayer in the mission that God had him on. He asks that they would pray for opportunities and bold clarity. One thing I love about this passage is what Paul doesn't ask prayer for. At the time, Paul was sitting in prison. He's sitting there because he, he had just explained to a group of Jews that the Messiah had not just come for the Jews, but also came for the Gentiles. They didn't like that. All throughout um, the New Testament, you see this over and over again, that when the, the Jews hear that Jesus was not just for them, but also now for the Gentiles, they, don't, they do not respond well to it. And they, they kind of, there was multiple times that they attacked Paul over these things, but Paul gets put in prison, arrested for his, his statements and the way that he was in these things. And Paul, not one time in this section says, oh, and by the way, remember to pray that I get out of prison. Pray that God sends a, an angel to open up the, the prison like, like he did for, for Peter and, and those guys. Pray that God would do that. No, in fact, he, he says, I want you to devote to praying for opportunities to share and clarity as I do. Paul was kind of the last guy that you wanted to be guarding in, in prison uh, because as a guard, oftentimes you were chained to your prisoner. And Paul saw those chains as an opportunity. Oh, he can't even get away from me. <laughs> what a frustrating guy. Because as he's chained to them, he would, he would share the truth with them. What an opportunity. What an incredible heart that he would look and say, no, you know what, it's okay if I'm in prison. There's guys to share with here. There's people to lead to Christ here. There's people that need taught and led and directed here. And God's called me here and put me here for a purpose. I, I want you to think about this. Paul asked for prayer in these things. Have, have you ever been asked to pray? Well, yeah, we've been asked to pray. Most of us have. Um, maybe you've had a, a, a friend or family member ask you how to pray, or how about a missionary ask you to pray? Last month, we had two missionaries come to the church here on two different weeks, and, and I can tell you specifically, both of them asked for prayer from our church, and that means specifically from you, from those of you that were here, from those of you that were not here that are part of the church. He, they were asking for prayer. In fact, one of the missionaries grabbed Janae and I and, and had us stand against the back wall and took a picture of us to put in their book that they could be praying for us and ask for our requests more than just asking for us to pray for them. And I thought that was an incredible thing to see that. And they had this book full of all of these people that they're connected with that they pray for on a regular basis. But they asked for our prayer. How about the times that we as pastors have asked you to pray? How about the times that maybe you even felt that you should be praying for something or someone? Maybe you see something going on or you hear something going on. Yesterday, Janae and I, we were in Denver for a, a youth leader training put on by Dare to Share, and it was a really great day. But as we were leaving Denver, we, we stopped and we ate, and we were enjoying our meal and just enjoying talking through the day and what we learned. And, and then there, a, a woman sat next to us at a table over with her son and her mom. And this woman was just fighting tears. You could see it. They're, they're welling up in her eyes and you're going, what in the world is going on? You know, Janae, I'm always the one who's going, Janae, just don't make, come on, Janae, what are you doing? And she's just, she stares. Janae just stares. She's bold. <laughs> but she's just staring at this woman because she wants to know her, her compassion kicks in. And I, I, I'm envious of the compassion Janae has because she sees and she, she feels for them. She didn't even need to know what was going on. She saw a mother of a, of a young son just in tears and it broke her heart. And I remember sitting there going, well, maybe, maybe we need to be praying. Thinking this. I, well, and, and I'm saying you know, some prayers just silently. We just sat there for a little bit going, I don't, you know, they're right there, right next to us. And we don't want to be super, but at the same time, I'm going, do I need to just ask, hey, can, you know, what's going on? Can we pray for you? You know, the, oh, that's scary stuff sometimes though, right? But I, I, want you, I want you to think about these opportunities and times that we really go, that God brings to our hearts. Hey, pray, come to me. I think there's a reason why he does that. I think there's a reason why God says, here, I'm going to put this here in this desire to bring it to me. We have a desire to talk to our dad. We have a desire to talk to the Father. 
And he made it that way. I want you to think for a minute with me about one person in your life, maybe who you know, uh, that you don't know if they know Christ or not. Are you praying for them? We're, we're talking about missions this month, and this is, this is a huge part of that. I'm going to ask you right now to start praying for them. I think that, that we should be in constant prayer for the lost and for opportunities, boldness and clarity and sharing the gospel with them as Paul was saying. But before you commit to doing that, I want to challenge you with something from the book of 1 Samuel. You don't have to flip there, but in, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, we, we see the nation of Israel talking to Samuel and actually he talking to them after they had just decided that they wanted a king. They had been under the judges that God had appointed and under God's authority, and, and they wanted a king. They wanted a guy that they could see. They wanted a man with a crown. They looked around in the crowd, and there was one guy named Saul. He was a head taller than everybody else, and they said, him, he's big. He can be our king. You think there was more thought into it, but it really doesn't allude to much more than that. So, Greg, you want to be our king? You're, I mean, it's, <laughs> that's kind of what it was. He's tall. He'll handle things. He can see all of us. He'll take care of us. Samuel was explaining to them of the, the choice that they made because he was not pleased with this. God was not pleased with this. But God said, okay, give them a king. Let them pick their king. Anoint him, Samuel. Just do it. And Samuel had explained to them the way God felt about this. And, and they came to a point of literally saying, Upon, on top of all of our other sin, on top of all of our other evil, we've now committed the evil of asking for a king. Pray for us, Samuel, that God doesn't kill us. They realized and came to a point of repentance of going, whoa, God had already set this up and we looked at him and said, yeah, we like you, God, but we don't trust you. We want our way. Our way makes more sense, God. And when, when they found themselves in a place that they had committed a sin against God, they looked at Samuel and asked for prayer and Samuel looked at him and said, don't worry about God abandoning you. He's not going to abandon you. But he didn't look at them and say, Okay, because he's not going to abandon you and I already know this, I'm not going to pray for you. No, in fact, he says this in verse 23. He says, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. When they asked for prayer and he knew he needed to be praying for them, what applied was what we see in the New Testament where it says, If anyone knows what is right to do and does not do it, it is sin for them. And I want to challenge you with this. Before you commit to praying, I want you to realize that if you're going to commit to praying, you need to be committed to pray. Don't say, oh yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll pray for you. Yeah, I'll pray for this person. And, and then sin against God. By just saying, oh yeah, I'll do it, and then not doing it. We need to do this. We need to be committed to this. So here's my question. When it comes to missions, are you devoted, committed to praying for our missionaries that they would have opportunities, boldness, and clarity as Paul is asking for? Are you devoted to praying for the mission field around you that you would have opportunities to reach out to that coworker, that family member, that you would have boldness and clarity when sharing with that classmate or that friend? Devotion and prayer is the first area of my introspection that, that was pointed out to me as a failure, but unless I see my failings, I know that I can't make efforts to repent of them and, and, and move in the right direction. But the second area that we're going to move into that I found myself lacking when it came to my missions mentality was sharing. In the same section of Scripture in Colossians 4, look at verses 5 and 6. Paul goes on and he says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Verse 5 alone hits me really hard. How am I acting towards those who don't know Christ? How am I acting towards those that are outside of, of my regular Christian group, outside of my church? Am I treating them in a way that is honest, loving, full of integrity, patient, kind, peaceful? Am I treating them in a way that matches with what I claim to believe? Or would they have an honest right to laugh in my face and call me out if I tried to share Christ with them? Let me give you a picture of what it looks like to an unbeliever when we reach out uh, to them, but we're not living in a way that backs up what we're proclaiming. 
There was a salesman sitting in the office of a potential client. He was ready to give a bid for, for an upcoming project and very excited about this. He felt like they had a very good bid. And as he's looking around the office waiting for the, the, the man to come in, he sees the competitor's bid sitting on the desk. He's kind of sitting there going, yeah, I'll just, I'll just glance from here and see what it says. See if I need to make any quick adjustments on ours or see if we're even, even in this. He looks and he sees that the, he can see the whole paper except the final number. The final number is covered up. There's a Coke can sitting on top of it. And he goes, there are no cameras in here. Nobody's going to know. Let me just look to see. As he reaches out, he lifts up that Coke can and his heart sank as thousands of BBs fell out of the bottom of it. It was a test that was set up by the client in order to, to see the integrity of the company that wanted his business. Needless to say, the, the salesman did not make that sale that day. But is that you? When you are, are talking to somebody about Christ, do they see the BBs falling out from under you? Because they realize and they've seen your life and they look and say, "Were well, you telling me that you have something that I don't have? You have a God that guides you, a God that, that cares about you, a God that loves you and you say you love him but you act like this. What are you trying to tell me? You have, you have no integrity. I heard of a, a pastor who went into a store and one of the, the clerk at, at the register looked at him and said, does this guy go to your church? Well, yeah, he goes, goes to my church. He's been a member for 20 some years. And he says, well, he owes me this much money. He hasn't paid in three years. And he keeps coming in and, and putting more stuff on his bill when I'm not in here, when my employees are and they don't know. And I just don't think that that's good. And the pastor had to leave realizing, oh man, if I from my church even tried as, a, as the pastor to, to talk to this man at that moment, it would have been fruitless. If I had said, well, you should come to church, <laughs> you can come and confront him there. No. Um, is that what we look like? The sad truth is, for most of us, instead of um, being the one that people think of when they th hear the word trustworthy or full of integrity, instead of being the ones that they think of, the sad truth is most of us spend our day destroying our witness through dishonest, shameful, crude, rude, and flat-out mean acts. That's so what we do. We're, we look just like, if not worse, than uh, the, the world around us in a lot of times. A good question to ask yourself at the end of each day to kind of keep yourself accountable in this is, if I were to share Christ tonight with any one of my coworkers, friends, or classmates that I'd been around that day, would they find examples of this truth in the way that I lived today? Would they find examples of Christ in my life from the way I lived today? Beyond integrity comes an even harder one for many of us. He says, make the most of every opportunity. I want you to think about this. How many, how many times a month, how many times this month, have you had the opportunity to, to share the gospel with somebody? How many times this month? The, the question that follows that is the one we don't like. Did you? Are we truly making the most of every opportunity? Or have we fallen into the idea that, well, my life will proclaim the gospel, it will proclaim the truth, so I don't really have to share it with my words. I went to Mexico uh, in high school. We, we took 750 teenagers to Mexico, and we camped in tents for a week. It was fun. <laughs> we built 40 houses for people. And it was, it was an incredible time. A famous Christian band was there with us and helped us build our house. It was awesome. Really fun. People were ready for us to come. They had laid the cement down that we were building houses on and some of the families slept on it for weeks beforehand because they were so excited about the houses we were going to build. We built them these houses and not one person came to Christ from a house being built. I heard a statement yesterday at the training, when we go to build someone houses, we need to build them a house here and work on building them a house in heaven. And I liked that idea, I liked that thought, because that last day there, I, we got to do a VBS for kids, and, and the team had elected me as their leader, which was scary to me. I'd never led um, a team like that. And as we did this VBS, 
for this group of kids that was around us. We had about uh, 35 kids involved. I don't speak any Spanish. Lucy can tell you that. <laughs> Barely any. But I shared and a translator translated and 28 kids came to know Christ that day. And it was an incredible moment because I realized I didn't have really anything to do with this. I couldn't, the translator could have been saying something totally different than I was and I wouldn't have even known. I was shaky. I was sweaty. I'm always sweaty though, but it's, I was, I looked nervous. I had these open sores on my mouth from eating too hot of peppers, sadly. I looked like a wreck and these kids were looking at me like, what is this man doing? But they heard the truth. And while we built 40 houses and saw nothing, five minutes of sharing the truth and we saw 28 kids come to Christ. And I want you to realize with that that we, we can't just expect our good deeds to, to express the truth about Christ. In fact, most of us, if we look back at the statement on integrity here, we need to realize that our lives are not proclaiming anything good about Christ. I believe that when you combine a life that shows the truth with a mouth that shares the truth, you actually have something that people will accept, something that people can believe in. But it takes both. Colossians 4, 6, Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In every conversation, we need to be uh, declaring grace in how we speak, remaining full of integrity in what we say, because as Jesus told us in Matthew 5.13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. We have to begin living in, in such a way that if a person were to ask me about my life, I could easily point them without question to Christ. If someone were to come to me and say, well, why do you do this? It would make complete sense when I explained to them, well, this is why. It's not I, but the one that's in me. That's why. And they would look and go, yeah, okay. Backs it up. 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, this is our VBS verse a couple years ago. It says, instead you must worship Christ as Lord of your life and if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. I, I'm not trying to get you guys into this pattern of let's shame everyone. <laughs> but I think that if you live in such a way that people who even try to talk bad about you are immediately looked at with looks of, no, I know that person, they would never do that. Then, then you're starting to do what's right. That's what I long for in my life, that, that if one of the high schoolers heard something about me at the school, that they could look and say, no, he'd never do that, I know that. And they'd know it full well without any doubt. I would love that. That's, what, that's the, the way that I've been challenging the youth that we need to start looking at living in a way that's beyond reproach. Just as I asked you to be committed to praying earlier, I'm going to ask you to become committed to sharing. Not just expecting my good deeds to point others to Christ, but doing as the words of Paul challenged us and make the most of every opportunity. That means when I see an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, I take it. I open my mouth and I start uh, what we like to call a gospel conversation doesn't mean that every conversation that I have is going to end up in this time of, of me getting to share the gospel, but it does mean that in every relationship that I have with someone who I don't know where they stand with Christ, I am making efforts and strides to see them come to him, to find out where they stand. I want you to... Uh, to realize that some of you guys need to make those opportunities. You're in places that you've surrounded yourself in a, in a situation that you will not get any, and you've made it that way. Some of you God is saying, hey, take a step this way and an opportunity is going to come. I need you to be willing and move this way. Maybe it's, a, it's something of, of just actually talking to the people you work with. Maybe you're, you don't even do that. Maybe it's something of, oh, no, I, I drive this way or I go this way or I only go to this place at this time so I don't see that person or whatever it is. 
maybe I walk around in the school, I think of the high school, how they've got this big circle, and maybe you walk the wrong way around, the long way around to avoid a certain person. <laughs> it's tough. One of the things we use in youth group, we have a thing called a cause circle. And, and the reason why we call it a cause circle is not because we want to be, you know, all about causes, but because there's a, there's a thing when you look at the, the social injustices of the world that they like to bring up that youth are very uh, driven by. You see things like the amount of orphans, the hunger problem, things like that. And yet, there's a huge one. We have, we have an answer for, for people's eternity being spent in hell. We have an answer. We have a cure for that. And we're not sharing it. It's the greatest cause that we've been given. And one of the things I want to challenge you with is this thing that we do where you take three friends, family members, coworkers, classmates, and we put their names in this circle, and at the top it says pray. The first thing that you're doing is you're committing for these three friends, I'm going to pray. I'm going to be praying for them daily. The next one is pursue. I'm going to at least start trying at times to bring God into, bring my faith into our conversations. And then the last one is persuade. When an opportunity comes up to share the gospel, I take it. I know persuade sounds like a weird word. They just wanted to use three Ps for it. So, But we, take the, we make the most of every opportunity. After that, they have this little ABC thing, which all the kids quote the, the VBS thing and say, ask, what, what is it? Ask, believe, confess. What do, what do we say? Admit. Admit. There it is. See. But in this one, it actually stands for you want them to admit their faith in Christ. You want to help them belong to a church or a group that will help them grow in that faith. And then the C is help them to commit to the same cause that they would not just be a convert but become a disciple, one who's doing as Christ called us to do. Learning and following. We need to combine our, our devotion to prayer with a commitment to share. The last part of this dangerous mentality that I fell into was um, my caring. When I say caring, I'm not talking about the way that I take care of people. Every Sunday morning I get up extra early to go and put four dozen donuts in a box for you guys to care for you. And they're good. And I don't, I'm not complaining. It's fun. I'm talking about whether or not I actually care for people. Not what I'm doing for them, how I feel about them. Apathy is one of the most dangerous, it's the most dangerous mentality when, that we can have towards missions. It's the attitude of I don't care enough to actually do something. I might care a little, but not enough to do something. Most Christians in the U.S., I believe, fall into this category. Though we would never publicly admit it. Yesterday I, I heard something that, that kind of blew my mind. There's 12,000 Starbucks in, in the United States. 12,000. It's a lot of Starbucks. Some of you are very happy with that number. And, and we know Starbucks. It's kind of saturated our culture, right? Everyone knows Starbucks. There's 300,000 Protestant churches in the United States. And I, I, want, I don't even have to say it. But how is 12,000 saturating our culture and 300,000 doing nothing? We simply do not care enough about the truth and the importance of the gospel for us to share it or pray about it or even think about it outside of what it's done in our own lives. We look and say, well, Jesus saved me. It's awesome. Now I get to go to church and be part and I feel like I'm part of this group. We don't think about the people that don't have him. We don't think or care enough about it outside of my own heart, my own life, to reach out to somebody else about it. Our church mission statement starts with these, first, these six words. It says, motivated by the love of Christ. As you go on to read the, the rest of the uh, mission statement, you have to really answer that question at the beginning. Are you motivated by the love of Christ? Because as you read the rest, you'll see that all of the actions that we see in there, the three E's we call them, evangelize, edify, and equip, they are all outward focused. It doesn't say, motivated by the love of Christ, I come to church that I may be edified, that I may be equipped. 
I was evangelized. I know him now, so now we're good. It says, we exist to evangelize the world, edify believers, and equip them for service. All of those are outward. If I'm motivated by the love of me, I'm not going to have anything to do with outward things. If I'm motivated by the love of comfort or the love of possessions, the love of money, uh, the love of people's opinion, all of these things will cause me to be careless towards the mission that Christ has called me on when, when he said, go and make disciples. Maybe we've actually forgotten that love of Christ we're supposed to be motivated by. Uh, flip over to the book of Romans. I think we're reading through one of Mark's favorite books here. I love hearing Mark talk about his feelings towards Romans, the passion that, that's in it, because it really does portray uh, this book. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. I want you to listen closely to this and think about the love of Christ and what, what picture we see of it here. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. You want to see that love of Christ that, that we're supposed to be motivated by? We were his enemies, and he died for us. How many of you guys would actually die for an enemy, willingly? The, the picture that I shared with, with the youth today at Sunday school about Jesus and, and him carrying his cross, and what all went on at that time, he'd just been beaten and mocked. And he's carrying his cross, and there were women that were crying for him, and he stopped to comfort them not worrying about himself, but even comforting them. As they laid the cross down, he crawled to it and not away from it as most would have done because he was willing, and not only willing, his desire was to die for us that we might be back into a restored relationship with God. If that kind of love doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. But we need to remember that. We need to realize that daily. We need to constantly be coming back to the understanding that we still need Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Not just the one day that I accepted Him, but each and every day. It's through Him that I am saved. Through His love. That kind of love is the motivation that we are to be driven by. That kind of love will never cause carelessness. It demands action. And if you have that love in you, it is what will drive you to reach out to others. It is what will drive you in missions. <coughs> Motivated by the love of Christ, I share the truth of the gospel with my coworker. Motivated by the love of Christ, I live with integrity that I may draw others to him. Motivated by the love of Christ, I give of my own money and time to support the spreading of the gospel. Motivated by the love of Christ, I pray for those who are lost and those who are working to reach them. Motivated by the love of Christ, I actually see my entire attitude towards missions change. And I want to ask you today to really consider if that's you. As we look at missions this month, as we finish this month on it, I want you to think about, are you motivated by the love of Christ to a point that missions is important to you and not something you're careless towards? Are you motivated enough to be praying, devoted to prayer? Are you motivated enough to be sharing, speaking the truth when opportunities arise? Let's pray. God, as we close today, I ask that you would be working in our hearts. God, that you would grow us that from your word you would help us to realize what it is that we need to be doing, what it is that you've called us to, and to not deny it, to 
not ignore it, to not become careless towards it. God, help us in our prayer to be devoted. Help us, God, as you call us to share, to be committed. And help us in the way that we care, God, to not become careless, to not become apathetic to this, but to realize that there's a reason why you called us to go and to make disciples. And in that call, we were all called, God. Help us to respond to that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.